Hello friends, good morning to all. Today we are doing our 29th episode and today's topic is very very interested and what is that? How does the brain control the movement? So this is very very interesting topic but before that let me uh, tell you my name is Ashok Rupner and I am speaking from the campus of the ISAR Pune. So this is the building of the ISAR Pune. So let me show you the building. So here uh, you can see the building of the ISAR Pune and there is a very very nice actually court just entrance of the building and what is that? The ISAR Pune where tomorrow's science begins today and every second and the fourth Sunday we try to bring something why I mention you that today's topic is also very very interesting and what is that? Ki how does the brain control the uh, movement? So now let me show you the campus of the ISAR. So this is a campus of the ISAR. Of course after the lockdown definitely you can visit our campus uh, when there is a actually some uh, we will show you the, our laboratories and the various activity happening uh, in the uh, uh, campus. Now so let me uh, uh, show you the, our building. So actually this is our outreach center, here we do lot of activities for student, teachers and of course for the uh, parents. Now as I mention you today's topic, so uh, today we have invited Dr. Uh, Raghav Rajan and let me introduce the Raghav Rajan. Uh, Dr. Raghav Rajan has completed his B mechanical engineering from the Bits Pilani. Then he worked with the Upendra Singh Bhala at the National Center for Biological Science at, that is NCBS Bangalore for his PhD. Uh, then uh, for his postdoc uh, actually he completed his postdoc from Alison Dope at UCSA uh, for his of course uh, postdoc. He joined ISAR Pune in 2013, he is interested in broad question of how neural activity generate complex natural behavior. So without any further delay, I am requesting Dr. Raghav Rajan, please start your session. Uh, thank you uh, very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, this interesting topic. Um, so what I am going to talk about today is how does the brain control movements. So movement is something that we have learned uh, uh, as a child itself that movements are what distinguish animals and plants. Animals move a lot whereas plants do not move that much or they do not move from place to place. And here is a picture of one of the great animal migrations of uh, African buffaloes you know moving from one place to the other. Uh, and this is again there are many such examples of animals moving around. The question is how does the brain control these movements given that we know that the brain is what controls everything. Okay, so closer to here also, uh, you know, just to highlight something closer to here, uh, flamingos migrate from, uh, migrate to big one in Maharashtra every year uh, around this time, slightly earlier. Uh, but that's another uh, example of animals migrating or moving great distances. Okay, and so animals, here's another uh, uh, example that I've uh, put here where animals produce many different complex uh, movements. And what I'm going to highlight, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is starting with the simplest movement, the one in this corner here, which is just a knee jerk uh, reflex to more complex movements like this uh, that we and animals, uh, I mean, all animals, including us perform. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a sense of how does the brain produce these different uh, movements. So uh, all of these movements ultimately are produced by skeletal muscles in our body and that's what helps to move the different body parts. And in the human body, we have many different muscles and here's just a uh, cartoon or a picture of the human body showing many different muscles in the body. And all of these are involved in moving the different uh, body parts. Okay, so we have approximately 640 skeletal muscles in our body and they require for different movements. Every time these muscles contract or relax, they cause a uh, movement. So the question then uh, becomes, how do these muscles work? Okay, so it turns out skeletal muscles often work in pairs. So here's a, a, what are called a flexor and an extensor pair. One of them contracts while the other relaxes and this uh, uh, makes the movement possible. So in this case, for instance, here's a person who's uh, flexing their uh, biceps in this short video that you'll uh, see. And you'll see that this, well, when this muscle contracts, it pulls on the elbow and this, the other uh, of the flexor extensor pair 
this muscle uh, relaxes. Okay, and what you'll see now is that uh, uh, when the person uh, pulls the elbow or pulls the forearm in, this flexor contracts and the extensor relaxes. Whereas when the uh, person uh, extends it, then this muscle, uh, uh, you can see now, this is contracting, this is relaxing the triceps. And when uh, the person extends it out, this contracts while this muscle relaxes. Okay, so many of uh, our body's uh, parts work uh, using skeletal muscles that often work in pairs. Uh, one of them contracts and the other one relaxes and this uh, allows for movement of that body part. So now what control, so again, here, uh, this is just uh, uh, showing you that in a little more detail. The flexor muscle contracts, the extensor muscle relaxes and this elbow joint bends forward. Whereas if the flexor muscle relaxes and the extensor muscle contracts, the elbow joint straightens up. So this, uh, uh, then, uh, then the question uh, becomes, what makes these muscles move? Okay, what causes these muscles to contract and uh, relax? Okay, and it's the nerves. Nerves provide the signals to make muscles contract or relax. And this is a cartoon of the brain. And in this video, you'll see that the brain produces, produces electrical uh, signals, which are called action potentials or spikes. And each of these electrical signals is produced by one uh, neuron in the brain. And these electrical signals then travel down uh, from the brain through the spinal cord and then connect up to the different uh, muscles so that the muscles can contract or relax. And so in this short video, what you'll see is an action potential depicted as a small star that's generated somewhere in some part of the brain. Uh, and then that sort of travels down the uh, that neuron and then goes down the spinal cord and goes out to some muscle in the body. So you can see there that's the action potential traveling down. It goes down some nerve. Uh, and then once it gets down to some nerve, that action potential has arrived at the muscle and makes that muscle contract. Okay. So that's essentially how uh, muscles contract or relax because of these action potentials or electrical signals that nerves uh, produce, uh, once that travels down to a muscle, it makes the muscle contract or relax. So uh, a little bit more about what are these action potentials? And before we get to what are these action potentials, what are, uh, where are these action potentials produced? So within the brain, there are many neurons, okay? And you can think of these neurons as sort of processing cells. You know, they have an office, uh, which is, uh, I won't go into details of what they're called, but if you're interested, this is called the uh, soma, the cell body. You can think of it like an office where all the processing happens, you know, all the paperwork gets collected. And then uh, this neuron has a long uh, channel called uh, axon, you know, it's like a cable. And uh, within that cable, messages are transmitted. And those are the electrical signals that I'm talking about. Okay, so you can imagine that this person sitting here uh, is doing all the paperwork and then once uh, some processing is done, the person says, okay, time to send a message out. And then uh, there are people, you know, running down the axon carrying uh, this message. And essentially the action potential or the electrical signal that a neuron produces is a message that goes down this long cable called the axon. And at the end of this axon, is where it will connect to a muscle. And we'll see what happens at that end also a little, uh, in a little bit. So for now, uh, neurons, these neurons are the basic units of the nervous system. And our brain, our brain has about 1 billion neurons. You know, and 1 billion is one followed by nine zeros. And these neurons transmit electrical signals. Okay. So uh, these electrical signals are called action potentials. And again, you'll see this uh, earlier when I showed you that action potential, that action potential was at one, uh, at, the, you know, at the level of the entire brain. But here, what I'm going to show you in this video is an action potential uh, starting off in one particular neuron. Okay, and like I told you, this is the main processing office or the main office of the neuron. And these small blue things you'll see are uh, inputs coming into the neuron. Okay, so again, uh, you know, using that processing office analogy, you can imagine that uh, there are uh, many forms that are coming into this office, uh, which are all these blue dots. And when a certain number of these blue dots come, then the uh, processing office decides that it's time to send out an, a big signal uh, down this long cable. And this is what really goes down to the muscle and connects up to the uh, muscle. 
Okay, so in this video, what you'll see is a lot of these small blue dots keep coming in through the various uh, sides of the uh, neuron. And these are all the input cables for the uh, neuron. And once these blue dots, they sort of accumulate in this center. And once they reach a certain uh, amount, a critical amount, then uh, this neuron will uh, sort of glow and then it will produce a blue signal that will go all the way down this uh, axon. Okay, and all these colors are just uh, for visualization purpose. What really happens inside the neuron is a small electrical signal that's produced. It's a very tiny electrical signal, but there are millions of such electrical signals that are typically going in your brain. You know, in my brain, while I'm producing all these uh, sounds to you know communicate with you through this talk, and in your brain, because you're listening to this and uh, figuring out what I'm saying. Okay, so let me play this video for you. So there a lot of blue dots have been coming in and now the entire cell starts becoming blue and it becomes really blue there and then you know this action potential is generated and this action potential now slowly travels down um, the cable that is the axon and it reaches the end uh, where then it uh, passes on to the next cell or, the, uh, or a muscle. In this case what you're seeing is this action potential has gone down the uh, cable and it has reached the um, start of another neuron but this could also be a muscle and so then let's talk about what happens at this uh, junction uh, what you see here is that this signal comes down when that uh, you'll see this uh, neuron there some blue when that blue action potential comes down this neuron it glows and then a lot of these calcium uh, molecules, you know, they're small molecules that are sitting outside the neuron, they come into the cell and then all of these balls, they uh, fuse. And then this neuron spits out some chemicals, okay? And the, whatever it spits out, those chemicals, those chemicals can go and bind to, uh, or go and attach themselves to uh, other molecules that are sitting on the next neuron, or this could be the muscle. So if you imagine this, this is a muscle, uh, all of these chemicals that this neuron spat out, you know, these small black balls here, those go and bind to molecules that are sitting on the muscle. And this in turn produces an electrical signal in the muscle and that makes the muscle uh, contract. Okay. And so this essentially is what happens in our brains uh, or in animal brains, in all brains to uh, communicate, communicate between neurons in the brain, communicate between neurons and the muscles. Uh, this is also how uh, we see the outside world. You know, every time we see something, uh, there's an electrical signal generated in our eyes, which then goes into the brain and uh, allows us to perceive or see whatever it is outside. Okay. So these uh, electrical signals or action potentials are what are uh, important for uh, making muscles contract. And they are what are responsible for uh, producing movements ultimately. And so uh, again, these are like I said, these are passed on from one neuron to another. And uh, like I said, there are a billion neurons in our brains. And there are many, many, many more uh, connections, something like uh, yeah, 100,000 billion connections between neurons. So all of these neurons talk to each other. These neurons also talk to muscles. And uh, they pass on messages between each other. So now let's get back to uh, all of these different complex movements that I told you about. So I told you that all of these are uh, ultimately all of these uh, movements are uh, produced by muscles moving. Okay. In fact, even uh, speech, you know, I'm talking here, uh, but this is also a movement because this is essentially a movement of the vocal organ of mine. Okay, they're vocal muscles and these vocal muscles are moving because there are action potentials or these electrical signals coming from the brain down to my vocal muscles. And that is making these vocal muscles move in a particular pattern and produce whatever sound I'm making, which is, uh, you know, this talk. But all of these uh, movements here, uh, what I'm showing you on this slide are all uh, movements produced by these muscles. So now let's get down to uh, how do anim well, what do we understand about how these different kinds of movements are produced? So let's start with this uh, movement in the corner. So this is a simple knee jerk uh, reflex. Okay, these reflex actions are some of the simplest movements that uh, our, our body produces. And uh, this movement, uh, every time you've gone to a doctor's uh, clinic, your doctor might check uh, by taking a small hammer and lightly tapping below your knee. And what happens? 
your knee automatically jerks forward or your leg uh, jerks forward like this uh, and this is an involuntary action you don't have to think about it to make this uh, leg move forward but every time the doctor taps on it your leg automatically moves forward and there are many such reflexes like this for instance if i were to uh, you know puff some air at your face you're going to blink immediately and that's another form of uh, reflex okay so all of these reflexes are uh, involuntary in the sense that you don't have to think about it they are automatic in some senses and they are one of the simplest movements because we understand a lot about how these movements are produced and we know uh, how this uh, signal is conveyed right from the time that, uh, in this case the doctor taps below your knee to the uh, action potentials arriving at these muscles and making the uh, knee jerk forward okay so let's see how that's uh, done so here's a, a cartoon that my son drew for me, uh, which essentially explains how this knee jerk reflex uh, circuit works. It works directly through the spinal cord. So here's the um, behavior, like I told you, the uh, if you tap on the knee with, under the knee with this hammer, then the uh, leg moves forward. So what happens? So it turns out here uh, there are some nerves in the uh, knee. Okay. And these nerves are activated when uh, this hammer taps on the skin. Okay, these are the many such nerves on the skin, on uh, all parts of our body, which are important for uh, sensing touch. Okay, and this the nerves, the specific nerves here, uh, they connect up. They go uh, to the spinal cord. So this is a part of the spinal cord, and not drawn the entire spinal cord, but rather th these nerves send signals again through those electrical signals I told you. Uh, this nerve sends an electrical signal to the spinal cord and says, oh, look, I, uh, you know, I got a, uh, a hammer hit my, uh, some part of my skin. And that signal then goes and uh, transmits a signal back to uh, another neuron, which then connects up to this, uh, these flexor extensor pairs in the um, thigh. And this makes the entire uh, knee, uh, so here's the extensor and flexor, uh, the signal comes back from the spinal cord, connects to this, and makes the um, leg move forward. Okay, and these are various terms for uh, the different neurons. So, for instance, the neuron that conveys the signal from the skin to the spinal cord is called a sensory neuron, uh, whereas a neuron that conveys a signal from the spinal cord to the muscle is called a motor neuron. So, again, the uh, terms are not really important. What is important to understand? is that a signal goes from the knee through a nerve to the spinal cord. And then there's another nerve in the spinal cord that uh, uh, carries back information to this extensor and makes the extensor contract. And this moves the leg forward. Uh, and that's essentially how this simple uh, knee jerk reflex uh, works. And this kind of a reflex is also uh, what makes you remove your hand when you uh, feel something hot, when you touch something hot. So as soon as you touch something hot, there's again a signal sent by neurons uh, or pain receptors uh, in the hand. And this goes to the spinal cord. And uh, immediately the spinal cord sends another message out through a, another neuron uh, back to these uh, muscles and says, move the hand out of the way. And the, uh, these are all called reflexes again, because we don't think about it. And we don't think about, why do we say we don't think about it? Because this really doesn't go to the brain at all. Uh, you know, this just goes to the spinal cord and comes back to the muscles and makes the uh, appropriate movement. There is a message that is sent to the brain, but that is for later uh, use. You know, this that allows the brain to, um, you know, remember that event and, you know, talk about it later and use it for other uh, purposes. But if we had to wait for the brain to, uh, you know, send back a signal, it would take a long time uh, and, you know, your hand would get hurt uh, by this hot substance. Instead, uh, the way these reflexes work is they go directly to the spinal cord and they're very quick and make sure that we don't harm ourselves. So this, uh, many of the, uh, many animals have escape responses that are also stimulated by uh, simple circuits like this. Okay, that uh, as soon as there's a, for instance, a, um, a cockroach, when you uh, move uh, your hand behind it and create some wind, then the cockroach senses that and immediately realizes there's a predator around and decides to escape. And that is also a simple example of a, uh, or a very simple example of a, a sort of reflex uh, behavior. Okay, one of the simplest movements that we understand. So, um, 
this is also similar uh, uh, reflex so uh, since i said that you know uh, if it goes to the brain and comes back it's going to take a little longer uh, whereas if it goes to the spinal cord this is going to be fast uh, the next question you might think of is uh, how fast do these electrical signals uh, travel and by now you might have worked this out yourself because uh, when we touch something hot uh, i told you that it uh, there's a message transmitted from the fingertip uh, to the spinal cord which is somewhere here at the back and then uh, there's a message that goes back from there back to this uh, muscle and you know that when you touch something hot uh, we take our hands out uh, hardly you know uh, hardly half a second or even less we pull our hand back okay and uh, uh these action potentials or these electrical signals actually travel uh, they last only about a millisecond uh, or a thousandth of a second you know so that's how long one uh, action potential lasts you know each of these signals is about is like a small beep that's about 1000th of a second long they travel at about uh, 0.5 to 100 meters per second or 1.8 kilometers per hour or all the i mean they can in some neurons they travel as Uh, slow as 1.8 kilometers per hour, but in other neurons they can actually travel as fast as 360 kilometers per hour, and that's you know uh, the same speed or faster than a car on the road. So you can imagine why uh, we're able to remove our hands uh, from that hot thing so quickly. Okay, because these electrical signals is traveling over a reasonable distance, but it's pretty fast and it comes uh, back and uh, makes the muscle uh, withdraw the hand immediately. Okay. so this uh, uh, like i said this reflex must uh, takes about half a second sometimes it's as little as 0.05 uh, seconds and in fact uh, i remember i mean if you've been to a, a science museum again uh, the one in pimpri chinchwad uh, nearby here i uh, used to have a, one of those experiments where you can look at reaction time you're shown a color and you're asked to press a button as soon as that color changes and that in fact involves the brain Uh, but that there also you're supposed to detect uh, a color changing and press a button and this happens really quickly you can do it as fast as you know 100 uh, 1/10th of a second or 2 tenths of a second which is 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds this reflex itself as uh, i have uh, shown here takes only about half a second uh, sometimes even less and that's the time for one eye blink so this is very fast okay so uh, what i've told you is that this uh, reflex is involves a simple circuit you know a few neurons uh, from the uh, from whatever part of the body is stimulated uh, in this case the uh, in this case the knee the neuron uh, near the knee that neuron sends a signal to the spinal cord um, and then the spinal cord sends back a signal to the muscles and makes the muscles contract and makes them move okay so it's a very simple circuit which involves only a, a few or a limited number of neurons which make connections with each other and make connections to the uh, muscle but are all of these movements also uh, reflex actions well these movements really aren't reflex actions right uh, this is a, a cheetah running to catch a gazelle uh, and we know that these movements are not uh, reflex actions this uh, cheetah running to catch the gazelle is triggered by the sight of the cheetah but after that this is not a you know simple case of a reflex action but what is interesting about this movement the cheetah running to catch the gazelle is it's a rhythmic movement you know much like our running and walking for instance the what i mean by rhythmic is our running or walking involves the same set of movements again over and over again so for instance when we walk we're moving our left leg forward um then right leg left leg right leg left leg right leg okay so the pattern of walking is exactly the same and often what we can do is we can uh, think about something else while we are walking we're not really concentrating and saying am i moving my left leg forward now now i need to move my right leg now i need to move, move my left leg etc instead uh, it happens automatically we move left right left right until maybe we uh, encounter a stone on the way or we you know fall uh, see a pit on the road and that's when you have to correct your uh, move okay but so what do we know about how these Uh, rhythmic movements are produced in the brain okay so here's a um, here's an example okay what i'm going to show you is um, what happens when we are walking okay and this walking involves alternate activity like i said in uh, left and right leg muscles okay 
So the left leg muscles are uh, active first, then the right leg muscles and so on. And within the left also, uh, when we walk, we first uh, bend this uh, leg backwards at the knee, and then we stretch it out forward. And then we do it for the other leg. Okay, so uh, these uh, muscles, the flexor, which is the hamstring here, and the extends for the quadriceps, these are also going to alternatively contract and expand. So for instance, uh, when you move your uh, leg back like this, this flexor hamstring contracts, whereas when you extend your leg, this extensor, this quadriceps contracts. Okay, so now what we'll uh, see is a video of a person uh, walking. So you'll see that person walking on a treadmill. And what people have done is to uh, monitor their muscle activity. So what you can, uh, like I told you, muscles produce electrical signals and we can put small electrodes on the uh, skin of the person and monitor these uh, electrical activity of the muscles. And this is essentially what uh, happens when you go to get your uh, ECG checked or your EEG, for instance. The ECG is something that everyone uh, is more familiar with. But what the ECG essentially does is uh, uh, the doctor puts a set of electrodes around your heart and in other places. And what they're recording is the uh, electrical activity of the heart. It's called an elect electrocardiogram. And this electrical activity is recorded through these electrodes that are placed on the skin. Okay, and then what you're recording is electrical activity of the muscles of the heart. In the same way, you can record the electrical activity of the uh, muscles in the leg while a person is walking, for instance, on a treadmill. So the person is not really walking forward, but walking at one spot so that it's easy uh, for the experimenter to record the electrical activity. And you can ask uh, what is happening to the uh, different muscles. And like I told you here, what you'll see uh, in this plot is a video of the person walking. And in this, you'll see the, um, the flexor and the extensor, that is the hamstring, the quadriceps, the right, left, and you'll see how they alternate, okay, as the person uh, walks. So let's watch that now. And you'll see as this person is uh, walking, you'll see which muscles are active because it's color coded in that uh, fashion. And you'll see this changing as well. So let me play that for you again. So again, here you'll see the muscles that are active, uh, um, becoming bright orange and you'll see here uh, that it's right, left, right? As you see here, first it was right, left, right, left, right, left, okay? So this walking essentially uh, or any rhythmic movement like walking, walking is an uh, is a easy example that I can use to uh, illustrate the concept, but the concept ap applies to all other rhythmic movements also. Um, so walking, uh, like other rhythmic movements, involves alternate activity in left and right. And how does the brain produce this alternate activity? So it turns out that uh, we know a lot of, about this from research on different kinds of animals, because animals also produce these kinds of uh, rhythmic patterns. And this one that I'm showing you here is from a lobster. Um, so this alternating activity is, called, is produced by something called a central pattern generating uh, circuit. So again, the names really don't uh, matter, uh, but uh, the concept that I want to get across is that there are uh, circuits in the brain or there are neurons in the brain, uh, either a single neuron or groups of neurons that have the capability to produce a particular rhythm. Uh, in this case, for instance, these neurons connect with each other in different ways. It again really doesn't matter how, uh, you know, the details of these connections, etc. don't matter. But if you look at the uh, electrical signals in these neurons, there are three neurons, for instance, shown here. Uh, this is part of the lobster's uh, stomach, and it's part of the chewing rhythm in the lobster. Uh, these three neurons, they produce electrical signals uh, one after the other. So uh, the red is this ABPD neuron. Uh, it produces electrical signals first, and then the LP neuron produces electrical signals, and then the uh, PY neuron produces electrical signals. And then the same uh, rhythm starts all over again. So this rhythm of ABPD first, then LP, PY, uh, is a rhythm that can happen without any external signals to this circuit. Okay, the circuit is capable of producing these uh, signals in a rhythmic fashion, you know, keep alternating without any external uh, signals. And that's essentially what uh, walking or any other rhythmic movement that we perform also. Once you start walking, 
then you can continue working like i said you know you don't have to think about it uh, you are thinking about something else essentially while you are uh, walking or running okay and this is essentially what such a circuit uh, seems to be capable of uh, producing once you start the circuit off then it can produce a rhythmic uh, uh, movement okay and we think that such central and people have found evidence for such central pattern generating circuits in our brains as well okay so across animals we think that there are uh, such central pattern generating circuits that produce rhythmic electrical activity and this rhythmic electrical activity gets connected to uh, muscles different sets of muscles and allows us to produce rhythmic uh, movements okay uh, our heart Uh, the heartbeat rhythm is also produced by a group of uh, neurons uh, called pacemakers and these neurons again are capable of producing rhythmic activity on their own they don't uh, need the connections but some of these neurons are capable of producing rhythmic activity on their own also and that's what allows us to continue uh, beating our heart but just like uh, uh, i gave you in the example of uh, uh, walking okay so before i get that so uh the different parts of our uh, brain uh, people have found that um different kinds of movements are uh, controlled by different uh, parts and there are most of these central pattern generating circuits are located in the brain stem and spinal cord so this spinal cord region uh, this is important for all the reflexes like i told you it's important for locomotion also walking and things many of these walking circuits are uh, controlled by Uh, spinal cord and some mid brain and brain stem regions and the brain stem uh, region is really important or the lower part of your brain is really important for respiration chewing swallowing etc and that's another reason that you know uh, you've seen all those advertisements about wearing a helmet when you uh, ride a two wheeler because again the helmet protects the back of your head and that back of your head is the really important uh, part that generates all of these central pattern generating uh, circuits Uh, all of the other parts of the brain are also important uh, but uh, damage to the brain stem the back of the neck uh, you know does not allow you to produce any of these uh, uh, rhythms like you know a fundamental rhythm like breathing is also impaired if we get hit uh, very badly at the back of the neck so another reason that uh, you know everyone should wear a helmet when riding a, a bike and this is one reason why uh, you are asked to wear a helmet while riding a bike so uh, like i said these uh, central pattern generating circuits can produce rhythmic movements like this uh, and like i told you the walking while normally you won't think about uh, walking you do if you hit a stone then you have to change your rhythm or for instance if you are walking you are uh, doing left right alternating if you start walking a little faster um, you are still doing left right alternation when you are running you are still doing left right alternation but the speed of this circuit changes the speed of this rhythm and again uh, many of these we understand uh, because these uh, rhythmic circuits can be changed or tuned in different ways to other neurons in the brain which allow for the same circuit to produce uh, these rhythmic movements at different uh, rhythms okay uh, for us it doesn't uh, make much of a uh, i mean we can run at all these speeds but we are essentially using only these two legs but for instance if you've seen a, a four legged animal running uh when it's walking the left and right hind legs are uh, alternating but when it's galloping for instance uh the front two legs are going together and the back two legs are uh, going together okay so even the which leg is coordinated with which leg can change depending on the movement but the muscles remember are exactly the same there only one set of muscles for the right leg and the left leg uh the right front leg and the left front leg and the right hind leg and the left uh, hind leg but the way these are controlled these rhythmic circuits can be tuned and changed a bit according to the what behavior needs to be produced and so we understand a lot about the ways in which these circuits are tuned so that you can produce a variety of different rhythmic behaviors in the, in a in a four legged animal's case uh, the animal can walk the animal can for if we take a horse for instance it can walk it can trot it can gallop Uh, and all of these essentially are different uh, uh, running but running at very different uh, speed so what i've shown you so far is 
that there are uh, very simple movements like uh, reflex movements which are controlled entirely by the spinal cord which involve a couple of a few a small set of uh, neurons uh, then i've shown you that uh, there are other movements which are rhythmic you know which involve uh, the same action being repeated over and over again uh, that is slightly different from these reflexes but it's controlled by uh, dedicated groups of neurons that can produce this rhythmic activity and ensure that the same action gets repeated over and over again but what about more complex movements uh, like this like uh, uh, ms subalakshmi singing or you know this uh, uh, whale jumping out breaching or this dolphin the spinner dolphin jumping out uh, what how does the brain control these kinds of uh, move and that's essentially where um, you know the uh, uh, so again um, we understand some amount of this we this is thing that we don't fully understand yet uh, but what we do understand is that we know that the many different muscles of the body are uh, involved for instance here uh, for ms uh, singing here it's not only the muscles of the vocal organ but the respiration also has to be synchronized because uh, you know it's it uh, respiration and uh, vocalization they all share the same uh, trachea or the pipe so respiration has to be synchronized then the person moves their uh, face changes the expression on their faces moves their hands uh, so many different muscles are involved uh, even in these complex uh, movements okay and again the correct sequence of muscles needs to be activated otherwise the sounds in this example that i'm giving you the sounds that are produced will be very different um in again you know when i am giving this talk i need to activate the muscles in the correct order otherwise you know the sounds that are coming out are not going to be intelligible i might make the same sounds but if i make it in a different order they don't make sense they don't form a particular word okay so the correct sequence of muscles need to be activated and what we also know now is that there are three phases to producing this uh, movement so there is a planning phase when there is already uh, some amount of activity going on in the brain this electrical activity has started in the brain uh, this planning phase involves uh, deciding where to move in what way to move uh, how fast to contract these muscles how much to contract them etc then there is a phase uh, which is the initiating movement which actually involves actually starting the movement okay and uh, there's a phase which involves executing the actual movement that involves you know actually moving the muscles in the correct way and there are many different experiments that have shown us that there are uh, these three uh, possibly independent possibly also connected uh, phases you know of movement planning uh, initiating and executing move uh, we know that in the human brain for instance uh, there are neurons in different parts of the motor area of the brain that control these diff- movements of the different body parts so for instance here what i'm showing you is this part of the human brain which is called the primary motor cortex it's on the surface of the brain somewhere uh, about here and this uh, controls different parts of the body and we know that uh these different uh parts you know uh of the surface of the brain so this is just a, a picture of the surface of the brain okay so this part is taken out here and uh, we know that these uh different portions connect to different muscles of the body but there is a very nice organized map on the uh, surface of the brain so for instance this part of the brain controls the head and this part will control the head uh, in me in you and in all all of us you know there's uh, the map is similar in all people there's a slight uh, difference but to a large extent uh, this part of the uh, brain somewhere here or somewhere here is what controls muscles in the head okay and this part of the uh, body controls the eye uh, this part of the brain controls the eyes nose face lips etc okay and this small man here or what is called the homunculus is essentially a representation of how much of the brain is devoted to the different parts of the um, body um, so if we were to uh, so what this essentially shows is there's a lot of uh, brain devoted to moving the hands uh, moving different parts of the face you know the uh, mouth uh, the eyes uh, ears of course we can't move except some people still have muscles to move the ears which are called vestigial muscles but essentially uh, we 
there's a lot of uh, brain involved in uh, or uh, that's involved in controlling hands because for us the hands are really the most important parts for uh, touching and uh, you know uh, looking at surfaces and uh, or feeling surfaces and understanding the texture of surfaces uh, and basically interacting with the external world so much of what we understand about uh, how complex movement sequences are uh, produced um comes from work that has been done in this uh, bird i mean there's a lot of work that has been done in uh, various other animals but this is something that uh, my lab also uh, studies my lab at isa pune we study this small bird which is called a zebra finch it's called a zebra finch because it has zebra stripes here and this bird is native to australia and uh, what it does is it produces a song um, just like the many songbirds outside Uh, you know that you might be hearing uh, now outside my window also uh, but these song birds produce songs and these songs are very like human speech uh, they involve the uh, vocal muscles coordination of the vocal muscles of the bird uh, and just like human speech these birds learn these uh, songs from their uh, parents okay and this zebra finch so this is a male zebra finch and this is a female zebra finch and in the next slide what i'll show you is a video um these songs are used by these birds to communicate with each other to quote female uh, birds so what you'll see in the next slide is this bird um it'll notice the other bird and start producing a, a song so now I'll listen to this uh, song okay so you must have heard it there uh, this was the uh, male zebra finch uh, on the left here if i can find my cursor yeah this was a male zebra finch and this was a female zebra finch and as soon as the male zebra finch uh, saw the female zebra finch he got up he went there and started producing the song along with a dance and the song sounded something like koki ku koki ku koki ku and the female also produced some vocalization so it's a dialogue between the uh, two birds okay uh, but what's interesting about this uh, song is that uh, it's a, a complex movement and uh, it there's a particular pattern to it you know a koki ku koki ku koki ku and this pattern is repeated multiple times um and we can look at this pattern in the lab uh, we use something called a spectrogram so again this is uh, uh, i don't want to go too much into the details but essentially what we're doing is we're trying to understand what frequencies are there in the uh, sound that the bird is uh, producing at different times and trying to see whether there is a pattern okay so here this is a small graph which uh, you can get by uh, recording putting a microphone on top of the bird's cage and recording the sound that the bird produced and then what we do is we use uh, complex algorithms which uh, basically involve fourier transforms which you may know about Uh, but essentially what we're doing is we're asking in the sound that the bird uh, produced uh, what frequencies are present okay at what at different times and what you see here is time on the x axis uh, frequency on the y axis and these different colors especially uh, represent some sound being produced and these white spaces in between the uh, sounds are silent periods so like i said this bird produced a ko ki ku ko ki ku ko ki ku And between the score and key, it'll uh, leave a short gap, and that's what shows up here as a white portion, whereas there are colored portions which represent some sound. Okay, and how dark these uh, uh, bands are or these colors are represent how loud the sound is at that particular frequency. So again, I'm not going to go into the details. What I want you to understand uh, or look at here is appreciate that. this sound is very different or this pattern on this uh, you know this uh, image is different from this pattern is different from this pattern and these are the different sounds that the bird uh, produces and the advantage of this uh, uh, bird for an experiment is that this bird produces a particular pattern of sounds in exactly the same order again and again so you can imagine it produces one word okay are all the words that we produce are a combination of multiple sounds but you can imagine that this word produces one word let's say it produces the word song and it produces the word song over and over again song 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 
but the song itself is uh, uh, it's made up of different sounds in it like sir or ng okay and these different sounds uh, represent a uh, you know they are each produced by a certain set of muscles moving in the uh, bird's vocal organ and what we can do is we can study what happens in the brain when uh, these this the bird produces this song and try and understand how complex movement sequences are uh, produced um like i said you know the song itself is uh, learned by young birds just like human speech and it's part of a courtship ritual it's how this bird communicates with female birds okay and what we know right now is that uh, this song is produced by uh, the sequential and orderly activity of a group of neurons in the bird's brain uh, so for instance if you imagine you know that there are 10 neurons in this bird's brain there are many more but uh, i'm just showing you for the sake of you know uh, showing you how this happens but imagine there are 10 neurons all of these neurons are quiet they're not producing those electrical signals that i told you about action potentials and every time one of these neurons produces an action potential it will change in color from blue to red so for instance this neuron is active first and then the bird produces one part of its song and then that neuron becomes active and it produces another part of its song and then this neuron is active and it produces another part of its song and so on you know different neurons are active and uh, different um parts of the bird song are uh, produced and in this way the bird pr produces the entire song because a certain set of neurons are active in a particular order so this is a little different from what i told you about those rhythmic circuits rather here there are a group of neurons that are activated in a specific order to produce a particular sound and we think that similar uh, uh, mechanisms or similar things happen in our brain uh but you can imagine that maybe this happens uh, you know the there are a group of neurons in our brain that control our vocal organ uh, unlike the bird which produces only one word we are able to produce multiple uh, words and this may in fact involve just activating all of these neurons in different orders each of these orders must be controlling one particular word and when we are uh when we are babies we learn these uh, sounds we don't know how to make them when we as soon as we are born but rather we learn them and as we learn them these orders are also uh, somehow wired up in our brain or connected together and then every time this order is activated a particular sound is uh, put so i'm going to uh, i have only a few more slides now but uh, uh, essentially this is how we think that um, you know more complex movements are uh, produced and as a uh, interesting tidbit you know i'm going to share with you at the uh, end this is something that uh, i recently found out about but going back to you know um, the title of my talk which was how does a brain control uh, movements and what i told you at the beginning that you know uh, our uh, movements uh, define differences between animals and plants and this is something that we've learned uh, from when we were a child that you know animals move uh or animals move from place to place more to be more exact and plants don't and this is a fundamental difference between animals and plants and here's an example of an animal a sea squirt that when it's young it can move okay and then it becomes immobile as an adult and the cool thing about this uh, animal is as they become immobile their brain also degenerates it has essentially swallows up its brain or something like that and uh again you know if you uh, agree with me that you know animals uh, uh, i mean movement is produced by the brain and uh, you know animals need to move then once this animal becomes stationary and becomes like a plant then maybe it doesn't need a, a brain any longer it you know it swallows up its brain or its brain degenerates and there's no brain anymore okay so i'm going to uh, uh, i have only another slide uh, but essentially what i'm going to repeat uh here is that i've shown you that there are many different complex movements and we uh, by breaking these movements down into the simplest the reflex movement then rhythmic movements and more complex movements i've shown you that uh, we uh, right now yeah, have a reasonable understanding of how all of these different movements are produced simple reflex movements are produced by a small group of neurons uh um, through a back and forth between one neuron activating another and going back to the muscles without involving the brain uh rhythmic movements are produced by a certain set of neurons that can produce a particular rhythm either individual neurons or groups of neurons 
that can produce rhythmic activity. And finally, more complex movements are produced by the orderly and sequential activity of uh, groups of neurons, larger groups of uh, neurons, okay. um, which is what I uh, showed you. And uh, I just want to end with this one uh, slide about what can we do with all this. Okay. Uh, and uh, as you see now, uh, the, um, people who are, we know of uh, a number of uh, cases of people who are paralyzed either because of injury or because of diseases like uh, Parkinson's disease, which makes movement initiation difficult or producing movements difficult. And we know now that, uh, you know, by studying all of this, uh, we can actually provide function back to these people. And here's an example of, uh, you know, how uh, people have used their understanding of the brain to, uh, to make brain machine interfaces that essentially allow this person, for instance, this person's hand is connected all to these electrical signals. And these are actually being recorded from the brain of this person and they connect back to the arm and they allow the hand to open, close and, you know, pour something out, uh, etc. And this is a person who did not, who had lost this uh, function uh, because of uh, spinal cord damage. Okay. And uh, we can actually, by understanding how the brain works, how it controls movements, we can provide uh, uh, people with uh, basic sets of movements at least so that, you know, they can start um, having, an, uh, you know, allowing some amount of uh, movement for these people to uh, improve the quality of their lives. We can also produce many different kinds of biomimetic robots. These are all examples of robots uh, that move, uh, but their movements are inspired by the way our movements are produced. Okay, because uh, as compared to robots and motors and things, our movements are much more complex and uh, cap we are capable of producing much more complicated movements than any robot, uh, than any robot we build. And by understanding how the brain does it, we can reproduce these in uh, uh, these kinds of what are called biomimetic robots and produce uh, more complicated kinds of movements and more complicated uh, robots. Okay. Uh, with that, I will end and I will say uh, thank you. Thank you for listening and thank you again for the Science Activity Center at ISER for coordinating this and, you know, uh, giving me an opportunity to do this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for this wonderful talk. Um, uh, uh, definitely our audience, uh, students, teachers and par parents understand uh, how the control our brain to the various uh, movement. Now for the audience, if you have any question uh, in your mind, so we are giving you our email address. Please send your questions uh, uh, by email and definitely we will forward your questions to uh, Dr. Raghav. Uh, of course, uh, for the next talk, you have to subscribe this channel. Please uh, subscribe this uh, YouTube channel and definitely every second and the fourth Sunday, we always bring something new for you. And of course, on the 25th April, hmm, after the 15 days, we are bringing one more interesting episode for you with the various activities. Every time we try to plan some, there should be some lectures plus some uh, demonstrations. So next time, definitely, we will bring some demonstration for you. So see you on the next, means after 15 days, um, uh, on the fourth uh, Sunday of this month, on the 25th April, with one more interesting episodes with lot of activities. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you.